Hello, my name is Daniel Hogan, and this is going to be another talk about mapping with machine learning. We're going to look in this talk at the question of how model performance depends on the amount of training data you use. So we'll ask in the context of uh, training data, how much is enough? So first a bit about uh, the organization that I'm a part of, Cosmic Works. Uh, Cosmic Works is uh, part of a uh, not-for-profit based out of Arlington, Virginia. And that Cosmic Works, our interest is in advancing analytics for satellite imagery. We do this in a number of ways. We undertake uh, research projects at the intersection of computer vision and geospatial analysis with an eye towards uh, work in foundational mapping. We also take a leading role with our industry partners in SpaceNet, which releases high quality, open source, labeled data sets of satellite imagery. We organize uh, challenges, data science and artificial intelligence challenges around those data sets. And the winners get uh, prize money and all the rest of us get the benefit of those winning codes being open source. Open source is at the core of uh, what we do. Not only do we open source winning uh, codes, we open source our own codes and as I mentioned, the data itself. Uh, in addition, uh, Cosmic Works does market analyses to better understand the technological and economic environment in which all of this is happening. So um, our focus here is, as I said, on uh, uh, deep learning and specifically computer vision for foundational mapping. Uh, the, the promise here is great. The ability to take a satellite image and generate a map from it with as high a quality as a human could do would be an amazing resource. It would be a great thing in general. It would be really great um, when the map is changing, when the conditions on the ground are changing, and in particular in the immediate aftermath of a natural disaster. So something like this in the hands of the hot OpenStreetMap team is, uh, or humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, excuse me, um, would, be an, uh, would be a wonderful resource to have. Um, but this is not a uh, solved problem, doing things with the, the level of uh, uh, automation I just described. It requires a lot of human uh, quality checking right now, and uh, it's to make progress in that end that, that we are interested. Now, neural nets, like are used here, are an example of uh, uh, supervised machine learning, meaning they learn by example, and we need to give them a lot of examples. That's the training data. Which brings us to the question of this talk, which is how does the model's performance depend on the amount of training data? We'll look specifically at models for finding building footprints, and we're going to uh, look at that question. We're also gonna ask the follow-up questions of does the answer depend on the model architecture, and does the answer depend on the geographic location you're looking at? And we'll see that the answer to those is roughly no, but with some exceptions that are interesting. So to start, uh, for our first uh, experiment here, uh, the data set that we'll use comes from SpaceNet. It's a data set of 27 different uh, satellite views of Atlanta, taken from slightly different angles over the course of a few minutes as a calibration run for the WorldView 2 satellite. Um, we'll train a model to find the building footprints in these. Uh, we'll use a lightly modified version of the fifth place prize winning model from the SpaceNet 4 competition, as submitted by the user with this screen name XDXD. Uh, we'll train it on uh, the uh, satellite imagery, which is uh, chipped into tiles about 450 meters on the side, and we'll train it with different numbers of tiles to check its performance. That performance will be evaluated using an F1 score for correctly finding the building footprints, um, where we have a technical definition of what correctly means. And um, so let's, uh, let's give it a go. So I'm going to get right to the point. Uh, the most important result of this talk will appear in the first chart that you see. This is a plot of model performance as measured, or will be, a, a plot of model performance as measured by F1 score as a function of how much training data you use. And initially, performance skyrockets with even small amounts of increase in training data. But at some point, 
it starts to fall off quite a bit. You get very uh, sharply diminishing returns, as, as eventually must be the case. I emphasize that the x-axis here is the amount of training data. It's not the training time. For each of these data points, the model was trained for however long it needed to be to get its maximum performance. And this shape of a sharp rise followed by diminishing returns means that compared to using huge amounts of data, you can get a large amount of the performance with a small amount of the data. This point over here is some 160 square kilometers with 27 different views. That's big data, and you do get a good F1 score. However, you can get two-thirds of that performance using 3% of that data. A uh, couple of statistical details here. Here the black line is uh, what you just saw. This is, again, performance versus training data. Um, I've also shown in different colors the breakdown with some different uh, viewing angle categories. Um, and the main difference from what you just saw is that the x-axis is now logarithmic, so you can see the, the low training data behavior a little bit better. A uh, couple new things that are added here. For one, we have error bars. Lots of AI papers do not include error bars, and that can make it difficult to know whether a small improvement represents a genuine improvement or just a statistical fluctuation. Um, the other thing that we have here is uh, these dotted lines, which are empirical uh, fits to the, the data that we saw following a very simple form, a constant minus an inverse power law. So looking at this just by eye, they seem to be very good fits to, uh, to the data, and that visual intuition uh, does hold up with a chi-squared test. So that was, uh, that was fine, but it was only for one architecture in one place, and we want to know, does any of this generalize more broadly? So for starters, let's look at that same data again with a different model. Uh, this model was the first place uh, winner in the SpaceNet4 competition from a uh, user with the username uh, Kanab. And uh, here you see the, the, same, uh, the same plot. Um, again, the curves are fit with that uh, same empirical form well, but this time the fitted parameters are different. They reflect the fact that in this case the curves, the performance rises more quickly. It gets closer to its top performance with less data. Um, now that's, uh, that's an interesting difference, and it has uh, a uh, consequence that becomes a little more clear if we compare this to the previous results, or the results with the previous model, which I will now overlay in a lighter color. If I look at an intermediate amount of data, like say 500 images, I would say this new model performs way better than the first one. If I look at, say, 20,000 images, I would say this new model performs only slightly better than the last one. And if the extrapolation holds up, then there actually will come a point not too far path to the right of this plot where the first model is the best one. The reason why this matters is that in um, AI and, and machine learning research, the whether or not a model is an improvement is often done by evaluating a current best model and a proposed new model uh, with some well-known canonical training data set to see what performs better. But in this case, the answer to that question is actually undefined. It depends on how much training data I'm using. And using one uh, training data set, using one canonical data set for comparison, which has one size, um, in cases like this one, would not capture uh, the full subtlety of what's going on. I also want to uh, consider geographic differences to see how that affects things. So for that, I turn to the SpaceNet2 data set, which, uh, shows, which includes uh, labeled satellite imagery with building footprints from four major world cities, as labeled there on the right. And this plot is another one like the plots I've been showing you the whole time of performance versus amount of training data. And you can see the results for the four uh, different cities. Um, and uh, again, it's the same sort of feature we've, say, we've seen before. Sharp rise, diminishing returns, following the same basic curve. Uh, the first thing you notice right away, though, is that 
the overall performance level is very different for the different cities. Uh, some of these are just harder machine learning problems than others. And that, uh, amount, that variation can be seen really at any uh, given amount of training data. Um, the, uh, the next thing that I want to highlight in this data is that, so for each city, I actually have two, two curves. So let me explain what the difference between those is. Uh, if for, each, uh, for each city, the lower curve, shown in the darker color here, represents the performance I get uh, on that city using a model that was trained just on data from that same city. And the amount of data used for training is, is as shown in the x-axis. The lighter colored curve, uh, the one which is the higher of the two in each pair, represents the performance that I get on each city from using a model that was trained on data from that city, but also on an equal amount of data from all the other cities. So for example, this point right here is what I get for training on Paris with 12 uh, tiles, whereas this point just above it is what I get for training on Paris and all the other tiles, uh, for on all, Paris and all the other cities for 12 tiles a piece, 48 in total. And this is interesting because it's possibly counterintuitive. You might think that, say I only want to do, I only want to make the best model of Paris that I can. I might have thought that the best bet is for me to use 12 tiles of Paris, if say I had 12 tiles from each of the cities, because that's the training data that is most relevant to my task at hand. But in fact, that's not what gives me the best performance. If I have 12 tiles from each city, and I just want the best model of Paris, I should still pile them all in there, train my model with all of them. And that causes a small uptick in performance. This is great because what it means is that for problems like this one, I don't have to make a trade-off between generality and performance. The model that's the most general, having been trained on all four of the cities, uh, is also the best on each one of them individually. And this is not a particularly gigantic uh, model. It fits very comfortably on one uh, GPU. Now, to be clear, if I could somehow get four times more data from Paris specifically, then yes, that's a better improvement still than, than using things from the, the uh, various cities. Um, that's, that's the equivalent of following this diagonal line instead of just this vertical line. And you can see that's a, a higher shift upwards in performance. Um, but the more interesting result is, is the first one, that the, uh, the general model works well. I also want to look at another feature in this plot that stands out a little bit. So as I reduce the amount of training data, as I go into the uh, low data limit, all four of these curves see plunging performances, as, as I would expect. Um, However, three of them seem to fall off uh, more or less in unison, whereas the fourth one declines at a more gentle rate. That, that's the set of results for Khartoum, Sudan. Now, since this is neither the highest uh, performing nor the lowest performing uh, city in this regime, it suggests that this isn't purely a matter of difficulty. There's something going on that is specific to Khartoum. Now, again, the error bars help us out. We know from the error bars that this is not just a statistical fluctuation. And uh, there's also nothing unusual about the distribution of building sizes in Khartoum. That's pretty typical from, compared to the other cities. Um, a, a visual inspection, though, shows just how different Khartoum looks uh, from the other cities. So here's a, a tile from Khartoum and a tile from, uh, in this case, Vegas. These are uh, hopefully reasonably representative tiles. And I wanted to better understand the differences in appearance, uh, specifically looking at edges and colors, which are the kinds of things that the very lowest levels of a neural net would pick up on and use as, as a starting point to, uh, to building up its, its model. So if you look at uh, edges, here I've uh, applied just an edge filter with a graphics program. 
You see in Vegas, uh, there are edges all over the place. In Khartoum, the edges are mostly localized to the buildings themselves. If you look at colors, um, Vegas is, uh, is a colorful place, uh, literally. And you can see uh, many of these are pretty recognizable uh, features, such as that uh, characteristic green color of backyard swimming pools. The color palette of Khartoum uh, is, more, uh, is more focused, is more constrained. And so a hypothesis here is that the consistent structure, the regularity in the Khartoum imagery lends itself to high performance at low amounts of training data. It may be that a rule of thumb that edges imply buildings actually works surprisingly well in Khartoum. And whereas um, this uh, greater variability in features in Vegas uh, really causes poor performance at low amounts of training data, although might turn out to be helpful at higher amounts. So it's an interesting uh, idea. It would require um, either work with synthetic data or an explainable AI approach to really understand what's going on here fully. But uh, even absent that, just doing work with more cities to better understand these kinds of variations uh, would be quite interesting. So in our survey here of how model performance depends on the amount of training data, the main result to reiterate is that models trained uh, with even a small fraction of the data, uh, comparatively speaking, often perform surprisingly well. And to give another case with some real numbers, across geographies, we saw that compared to using the full data sets, we could get 3 quarters of the performance with 1 16th of the data. Uh, we saw a class of functions that fit these curves very well, saw the value of using error bars, and um, saw the surprising result that when it comes to a trade-off between performance and generality, in some cases, there's no trade-off at all. And what all of this does is it helps us better understand these kinds of issues for making good decisions about um, understanding and developing machine learning with the idea of taking forms of this technology that require less and less amounts of uh, human quality control, taking them out of the lab and bringing them into real world applications like OpenStreetMap. Let me close by mentioning something that's uh, happening right now. The latest SpaceNet challenge has actually begun. It launched this week. It'll run through October 25th. This one is about identifying road paths in uh, satellite imagery. And not just the road paths, but also a reasonable safe speed for each road. Because once you know both of those things, you can do real optimal routing through a city. So you can learn more from our blog, our podcast, our GitHub, or just come talk to me. Thank you. Got about a minute or so for questions, if anybody has. Yeah, here it seems that you did the experiments with uh, the winner of the SpaceNet challenge. That's right. Uh, so basically, the way these challenges work is that you set up a training data set and a validation set, and then models are tuned based on that data, right? And then they come up with this best performing model. So do you think that there's a chance that if the experiments were done on another model, using another model which was probably like simpler, but essentially the goal for that was to uh, use a lower dimensional model than the results using the, these different kinds of training data sets might have been like differently, like different? Yeah, so that's very much a concern about whether we're really seeing the full spectrum of behaviors. I will say that um, the two models that I used were um, developed for SpaceNet 4, so they were developed for that Atlanta data set. So it was a little encouraging that we saw the same sorts of things with those other cities for SpaceNet 2, because the competitors would have had no incentive to focus on, on those ones specifically. Um, but 
But we, we do very much worry about the problem that you mentioned, which is why in the SpaceNet 5 challenge, uh, some of the final validation of the models is going to be done on a city that the competitors don't even know what the city is. We won't even say the name until after the results are in. Uh, so this was based around the, the amount of training data. Have you looked at other factors such as uh, uh, epochs, iterations, other things, and, and their effects on model efficacy? Uh, efficacy? Yeah, I looked a little bit at uh, um, the number of epochs, and uh, these models both had the interesting result that they kind of reached an optimal performance and stayed there, uh, at least for a long time until I got tired of training them. Um, sometimes things get to that optimum very quickly and then, and then go off the rails not too long after that. Um, so, but there are many other variables that one could also look at. Um, we've thought about looking at things like um, the quality of the labels. How does performance vary? You know, if you have great labels versus mediocre labels, things like that. Thank you. All right. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Shay Strong. I am the Director of Data Science and Machine Learning at Eagleview. Um, just as a little aside, Eagleview is a, a mid-sized company in the Seattle area that does a lot of high-resolution aerial capture. And I lead the team that does all of the geospatial uh, feature extraction at scale. But this talk is not going to be about any of that. Um, I got into data science, uh, and specifically geospatial data science, a little bit as an accident about five years ago now. Um, and my kind of my first jump into that was largely being exposed to OSM, both, you know, eventually collaborating, like working up the courage to collaborate largely on hot tasks and things, but then also learning to leverage that data for, you know, using what we've been talking about in terms of supervising machine learning models, um, just understanding the wealth of geospatial data there. Um, but this particular talk is really uh, more focused on, on my love of education and taking what I've learned from um, being in a machine learning based startup, the geospatial element contributing to OSM, and turning that into um, some uh, smaller scale curriculum at University of Washington. And then, you know, kind of working that into a broader theme of uh, teaching students uh, largely, uh, you know, how to create these models, what they're good for, what they're not good for. Um, and then, you know, this, this broader aspect of what does it take to democratize a lot of machine learning model development. Uh, so a lot of different themes there. Um, so I'm just going to dig right in. You're also in for a treat because my five-year-old approved of the design composition of this template. So there's a lot of really valuable colors in here. Um, <clears throat> So I'm, I'm going to be using machine learning a lot, uh, you know, as an acronym, um, ML, but, but really I'm talking about these convolutional neural networks that are really excellent at scaling uh, visual pattern extraction um, that we've seen some examples of with the building footprints and, and transportation networks. Um, and then, of course, you know, because largely, you know, the types of geospatial uh, data in the world that we live in, it's really the supervision of these models with the examples that we can create a really robust training data set and, and really extract the features that we're interested in. And part of that then, of course, can be leveraged from the, the OpenStreetMap um, community. But there's a piece of that is, is still, of course, there's curation. There's, you know, as a data scientist, you can't just download, you know, gigabytes worth of data from OpenStreetMap and just assume that it's all going to be unified and can be adopted for, for model usage. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, data curation that goes on there. Um, but then again, you know, going back to how can I uh, create knowledge base uh, within, you know, up and coming geospatial analysts, uh, you know, around what it takes to create these models and, and what, what that whole ecosystem looks like. Um, and then ultimately, like, could we create some type of open source, uh, open geo ML model marketplace? And a little bit more on that later. These are just examples of uh, machine learning derivative products that I've either worked at at Eagleview or I've done as part of my work with UW. You know, the top is, is all those little red boxes are the buildings. Um, I think this is Atlanta region. On the kind of the bottom left, my left hand side, is uh, uh, different types of um, uh, power lines and, and um, uh, electrical poles. And then uh, the kind of land classification map, this colorized inset map where you see a lot of the grays, that is kind of impervious surface mapping along with vegetation, different types of vegetation, um, pools you can see in that bright blue. 
And at the very bottom, this is a, a, a predictive analysis that utilized a lot of different geospatial information to, to try to assess um, the likelihood of, of water wells, wells fa failing in Uganda. So just different examples of kind of machine learning applications there. And that's what I wanted to bring as part of my educational workshops with UW. So it's kind of a, another little pla uh, uh, soapbox <laughs> aside here, um, at least in the world of, of machine learning and, and partly in geospatial machine learning applications, there's a huge um, kind of push towards platform adoption. A lot of big players um, and even small players, startups are really trying to create these platforms kind of all in one where you bring your data or you leverage their data and you can you know, maybe create a model, but then it lives in this very tightly bound ecosystem. And I find as a data scientist, that's really not what I'm interested in. Um, I think it, again, stems back from my desire to be open source and collaborative, um, but also I wanna know, I wanna get into the nuts and bolts and not have somebody dictate to me how to manage my models and my infrastructure. But at the same time, it's a challenge as a data scientist to understand, you know, how am I gonna make this work without the right cloud orchestration um, elements and the right labor? And then, you know, always that the proof of concept is easy. You know, machine learning models are not that hard anymore. The barrier to entry to actually running these models is, is pretty minimal. Um, but it's the scaling that's really complicated. You know, whether we saw previously that, you know, going across different regional um, areas or, or whatever the case may be. So that's the challenge. Um, and then kind of going back to the university side, I do find that there's you know, a lot of these uh, larger corporations or, or larger companies that um, have invested a lot in their platform development are also, they tend to be the big spenders in some of the university programs in terms of providing their tool sets for, for educational uses. Um, and then this, this last piece, which is still, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to get to, but uh, you know, we're starting to see a rise of model marketplaces. You know, there's the AWS model marketplace, there's a couple of others. Um, but again, really with this lean on, you, know, you pay for use. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential there kind of in more of an open um, source aspect. So my little puzzle piece here, like again, bringing all these pieces together, all of my difficulties and my struggles as a data scientist, but um, helping uh, UW with, you know, providing exposure, some cloud experience, you know, help <coughs> enhance the learning curve or, or expedite it, I guess, and maybe diminish a little bit of that, that control by the big players. Um, so what is UW, uh, the GeoHack Week in particular that I, I might have alluded to previously? Uh, this is a week-long uh, annual event that happens, it's actually, we're, this year, it starts Monday, um, so this is hot off the press for you that I'm sharing with you today, what I'm doing, but um, I was only recently involved in this. I, I moved to Seattle from Washington, D.C. last year and got pretty quickly involved in it, um, largely just out of curiosity, wanting to volunteer, and as soon as I started talking to some of the professors that were um, creating the content for this, they were like, yes, please come talk about machine learning, um, and so they, their kind of approach in 2018 was this software carpentry approach, which I was not super familiar with. Um, it's a lot of IPython notebooks, which I think is great, uh, but it's, it's a little bit, um, I think, harder to use in some of the geospatial applications. And so this year, I had really proposed to, to try to do a very seamless uh, week-long event where rather than having this, this software carpentry approach where each day uh, students might take bits and pieces about like what is vector data sets, what are raster data sets, maybe a little bit about machine learning, and let's create this one week long project that essentially students come in on Monday morning, uh, they start contributing immediately to OSM in terms of creating vector data and interacting with that type of platform, understand what that data is, and then over the course of the week, understand uh, progressively more complicated elements to then ultimately train a machine learning model with uh, the information that they had then checked in on Monday. And this is, uh, I think, again, totally experimental this coming week. Uh, the challenge, of course, too, is that the students that attend, it's about 50 students that are accepted. It's open globally. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a wide range. So there's undergrads, graduate students, there's working professionals that are all coming to this GeoHack Week to try to enhance their tool set around geospatial capabilities. And so it's a really interesting dynamic, but it can be a challenge to kind of teach to. But, Everything that's generated is all open source, and um, I, I think there's a lot of potential here to do something really interesting. Um, just a little bit more specifically on the element that I have helped um, co-create this year, uh, again, is this you know, leveraging OSM um, to create these machine learning models and, and 
you know, provide more insight into what being a geospatial data scientist is. And the thing that I'm really proud of is, you know, these 50 new students are going to become, on day one, OSM mappers. And we're actually bringing in um, a volunteer from the Missing Maps program in Seattle uh, to help uh, actually provide a lot of background and, and get the students up and running. And then I was able to negotiate with AWS for some free cloud compute um, using Amazon SageMaker, which uh, will uh, kind of help bridge the gap a little bit on model creation. Uh, so that I'm pretty excited about, but also slightly nervous um, to see how it, how it goes over. But then my unaffiliated personal goal is just to kind of advance some of the potential stagnant geospatial activities and create, you know, a community of, of uh, students, but also, you know, advanced researchers that are really interested in moving a lot of this forward. So kind of tapping on all four of those little puzzle pieces there. <clears throat> and this is my nice little infographic of what I consider geo, GeoML to be, to me. So, you know, there's these three core components and our curriculum is developed around these. Uh, kind of a mixture of different various libraries and open source, but then also just themes that, that are um, recurring. So, you know, on the raster data side, for students, these, these are the pixels, right? Um, but where do those come from? And, you know, there's a lot of GDAL usage and, and slippy map definitions, uh, georectification issues, getting kind of all that content in one day, but, but giving the students some exposure to that. Um, and then, you know, of course, raster plus vector. So the vector is going to be all of the label data that we're going to use for supervision. Um, and we're going to get that from OSM, but we're also going to contribute back through um, various means that way as well. But getting them used to understanding, you know, GeoPandas and OSM and X and over to over and all of these things that I have, have used a lot over the last five years. But again, building this, this um, tool set that ultimately leads to the machine learning endeavor. Right, so I think GeoML is just a really interesting space to apply machine learning to in general. There's this very visceral, visually quantifiable element to it where you can't hide behind the model, per se. It's going to always be confirmed by a human, potentially, or looked up on a map. And so I think you know, having these tool sets and, and educating the students on how to integrate all these things is really important. But again, kind of on the ML side, you know, learning what it takes to fuse the raster and vector data sets to create supervised uh, data uh, for training is really important. And then, you know, I'm, I'm you know, uh, at Eagle View work predominantly in AWS with Apache MXNet, so I, I kind of am leaning towards a lot of that as, as part of the tutorial, but just again exposing the students to, to applied levels of machine learning and not necessarily the theoretical elements. And I think I, I also like to go through with them a bit on this whole data curation side and what it takes, you know, as you're downloading the data and the information, what it takes to actually establish a, a good training data set. Um, do not need to read these, but these are all available open source uh, on my GitHub account under the Sagely project. But basically the, the, the lecture component to what I give is a, is a two hour long interactive workshop element, just getting them to spin up two different independent IPython notebooks. Um, we're focusing on this Cyclone Kenneth event uh, that was uh, you know, uh, in one of the, the major tasks in HOT back in April. And uh, you know, part of that is being able to uh, pull down the data, pull down all the polygons and all the, the labels and that kind of information, and just within one single notebook, create the, the label data needed for um, training the model. And then, the kind of following up and compartmentalizing the whole training data set with the model uh, side is a much shorter Python notebook that is actually, you know, take what you just created um, and interact with AWS S3 and, and these EC2 instances just notionally and train your own model and create an endpoint um, API that you can then hit with an additional data set and just look and see how you did. And a little bit, you know, right now is uh, it's still time overhead in terms of training a model, especially given the limited amount of time I have. So it's a, kind of the, the cooking show, like I kind of have data set aside and I have a model and they can hit it. But then just giving them the time to work through the various notebooks is I think a really going to be an important part of this. Um, this is kind of an example of, of unrelated output only because we haven't had the event yet. But this is where, in particular, there's, you'll see as we kind of zoom in, this was hurricane, uh, hurricane a couple years ago that hit Rockport in Texas pretty hard. Um, and the red boxes are all damaged buildings, and the blue, little blue boxes are tarps actually on top of roofs. 
And this, you know, I took a lot of the label data for the buildings themselves off of OSM and then had to go through a significant amount of curation to assess um, based on uh, digital globe imagery what was damaged and what wasn't damaged. And then it could scale that up with SageMaker. So it kind of is this really nice end-to-end -end little project. And this is essentially what the outcome of, is uh, for the students as well. And so just my last slide, you know, I, where I want to see this go, of course, we'll see how it goes this next week. But, you know, what does it look like to create more of an open marketplace? And how do you bring people and how do you incentivize people to contribute? Um, and that's something I'm really interested in pursuing, and I'm not quite sure how that's going to play out. But just to give you an example of, like, more of the commercial marketplaces, uh, you know, obviously this is not a new idea. There is one on AWS. I personally, as a data scientist, would never buy a model here. Um, I think that's just, it's not necessarily tailored to what I need, but I think from, I would love to see, you know, from an academic perspective, models made available that were just from papers, for instance. And then you have companies like Algorithmia who also provide, um, you know, the ability to use uh, free of charge, some of their core models. But again, it kind of, you know, bridges or puts you into this box of having to utilize their platform and their ecosystem in order to really leverage that information. So, you know, kind of, taking an abstraction from that and create something that's a little bit more um, uh, Lego block oriented, but that students and other practitioners like could, could contribute to, I think has a lot of value. So that's all I have. So I think I'm a little early, but thank you. Uh, thank you for that talk. Um, could you just elaborate a little bit more on the bullet under the, the first bullet, extricate the free models from their marriage? You just mean a, a black box model, like if you just rent it on AWS or whatever, you're just, are you asking like if they would give the, so you would understand how the model's working better or? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's like uh, free the model from the platform kind of a thing. And so I think, you know, what I'm seeing, and maybe not necessarily the case with some of the AWS models, where maybe you're spinning up a, an AMI that has that model there and you can build an infrastructure around it, but more kind of the, the platform-centric models, um, which is not, I'm not trying to, you know, create a bad stigma associated with that, but, um, but that you're, there's kind of this bring your data to my model and my platform, and I will take your data and I will alleviate all of your concerns and you don't need to worry about it. And I think there's a lot of uh, like interest in that because that is the hard part, but that because it's the hard part, it's the important part. And so I think just in you know understanding a little bit more about how the model might be orchestrated or integrated with your data, or if you have some control over the types of resources that the compute resources that you're using, like so that there's a there's kind of a black box around some of that that I think is smart for certain startups to try to alleviate, but but I think it. it it maybe is trying too hard to simplify the problem and not providing data scientists the opportunity to kind of go in there and, and get a little bit more dirty. Um, so that's that's kind of the intention there, but yeah. I'm just curious, uh, how much fair computing support did you get from AWS? Oh, oh, so they, uh, how much support, monetary support? Yeah, they've agreed, <laughs> so the numbers haven't exactly changed hands, but they've agreed to cover uh, a couple thousand dollars worth of compute cost, so. Yeah, and I, I felt, um, so I pulled a couple strings, you know, our, our company EagleView, um, is owned by a private equity firm, and we have some nice relationships with AWS where they, you know, we spend, we spend a lot of money on the cloud. We have a huge amount of imagery, petabytes of imagery we're processing. And so I felt like, you know, I could try to pull a couple strings and a couple K. <laughs> and <clears throat> I think we're good. All right, if Thank we you. don't have final questions.